and we're live. So it's just me riding solo. Doc had a, a life and kid duty and mom duty. So, and Nick is doing his normal border boat thing. So he won't be here today either. Uh, but we are rushing this one because we found out about a cool Kickstarter that's only live for 30 days. That's how Kickstarters work, people. Um, but first, let me tell you where you are. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. The podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, we're going to let our guest, Mr. James Kerr, introduce himself. I'm sorry, three nerdy uh, hosts? I, I, I don't... Uh... <laughs> So we got Doc Sessa, <laughs> former Army medic, and Nick Garver, former uh, Army Ranger, who both uh, had life exist. But you know, we're we wanted to get you in while the Kickstarter was still. Oh, I know, I know, I, and I completely understand. Like, I've got two kids sleeping in the other room that may well come in and bother us too, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so do that <laughs> well, inappropriate times. Yeah, like no, I, I, they're probably saving it for the most inappropriate time, right? Um, so, do. Uh, <laughs> hi, Jr. I'm James Kerr. I'm a uh, tabletop role-playing game uh, developer and publisher of Radio James Games, and I'm here to shamelessly plug my Kickstarter, which is called Fight to Survive, Role-Playing Martial Arts Meets Heart. Uh, thank you very much for having me on tonight. Outstanding. So uh, the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we found them. Uh, so we found him in the den of sin known as Twitter. Uh, and then I searched for him, and he's been all over the place, pimping his Kickstarter. And I thought, this sounds cool, because who didn't grow up watching fight movies in the 80s and 90s? And if you don't know what the 80s and 90s were like, you're too young. So sit down, kids. <laughs> well, if you don't know what the 80s and 90s were like, this is a good time to find out. Uh, Absolutely. There you go. We're, it's a teachable moment. That's what they call it in the biz. So uh, before we, we decide whether you get to stay, though, we got to ask you the religion questions. Are you ready for this? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for the hard-hitting questions. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Uh, unequivocally Star Trek. Um, really? What yeah. is it about Star Trek? Well, you know, I've been trying to, I've been thinking about this, I guess, because uh, Star Trek lives in my heart. Uh, you know, I, I I grew up with The Next Generation and the original series, and I was the right age for Voyager and Deep Space Nine. And I don't want to sound like a grumpy old Star Trek nerd and saying that the, the new Star Trek is not Star Trek enough. Uh, you know, I try to enjoy all of it, but uh, but my 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 love of it really does live back in the like late eighties and early nineties. Uh, you know, the, I lived in the, the broadcasting world for many years and probably the thing that I was most proud of in radio broadcasting was getting a chance to interview Melinda Snodgrass, who was the chief story editor for Star Trek, the next generation in the third season. She was responsible for writing the measure of a man, uh, the second season oh. episode where they put data on trial. Uh, she was responsible for introducing poker into the plot. Uh, she's basically responsible for the characteristics of data. And I got to, to grill her on end about her love of science fiction and her work uh, on Star Trek The Next Generation and also her GURPS game of Superworld that she had with George R. R. Martin and Roger Zelazny and Chris Claremont, among others. Uh, so it was a it was a real crowning achievement for me in broadcasting and being a total nerd. Uh, and yeah, uh, like the, I'm just trying to show you how how obsessed with Star Trek I am. I had a radio show for years on Star Trek too, uh, which you know before people started doing podcasts, it was a uh, it was it was basically just a podcast on a community radio station. So Star Trek is my answer. So did you ever play that Star uh, that GURPS game from the uh, Star Trek lady? Well, it was a Super World uh, version, like of GURPS, right? Which is, uh, and and she says that they were pretty, they were pretty fast and loose with the rules because they all just started kind of making up their own stories, right? Uh, right? So I didn't play with her, no, because at this point it was like 2008 or 2009 or something, uh, and she had been out of the, uh, you know, uh, New Mexico gaming space for quite a while. <laughs> but it was really fun to uh, to talk about how those role playing sensibilities fed into her work in science fiction and the kind of uh, stuff that she would go on to write for Star Trek. Okay. I've uh, heard of GURPS. I, tr when I was first looking into, cause I started with the RPG stuff through my oldest, who's really into like, he likes that kind of stuff. He was reading all the source books that the library had, which mostly were out of date and well-worn and pages were missing and art was drawn on. Cause you know, you've just got to draw the mustache on the, art right because why not yeah why everybody not? need people need more mustaches i guess <laughs> you're not biased at all yeah. uh and so like i came into it late and i got all the gurps books at one point in time because they're like oh that's the easiest system to learn and no 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 it's not i was like no, no, drowning no. in rules and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing 
So I know people who I... love it, but I, I know people who really love GURPS. But the, my defense of not particularly liking GURPS is that, um, well, the, the defense of it is, oh, you can do anything with it. There's there's rules for everything, and you don't have to use all the rules at once. And and it's like having a whole cow, you know, where normally you get a little bit of beef. And I'm like, well, listen, I'm only going to eat a little bit of beef, and, I, and then I'm staring at this cow carcass. And I don't know what to do with it. And I guess I'm supposed to ignore it, but it's uh, it becomes difficult. And that's, that's why I don't particularly enjoy running GURPS. But um, I mean, I got lucky when I got into gaming. I had friends that were in the business. So um, um, CJ Carrilla, who wrote the GURPS uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer manual, who now writes science fiction, Mill SF. And I've had, talked to him and we became friends on Facebook. And like Walt Robillard works in that space as well, um, producing games. So when I had questions when I was learning, I had actual professionals I could call. Well, I mean, for years, the the rule among RPG nerds was to pick up GURPS source books, no matter how you felt about the system, because they always had the most interesting source books. Period. Like uh, before, before it was cool. We had Discworld and GURPS, right? You had um, uh, the 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 oh, what is it? Shadow of the Torturer uh, series in in GURPS. You had like everything was going on in GURPS, so people would would pick them up just for the sake of having really cool source books and then yeah. adapt them to whatever system they were using. That was a big part of the hobby for a while. And yeah, it was, so, I mean, I can't like, I love it. I, I had the opportunity last year to interview Steve Jackson uh, during a, um, a Gary con and ask him all these questions. Uh, he's a guy who really knows his stuff. Right. And, um, and he, I would he went so. on. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you never know. Right. Like sometimes you meet uh, some people who, uh, you know, are at the height of their game and you're like, really? Cause you're just like me. I don't know. But no, he was really impressive. Uh, Cause his, uh, his first game out of the gate was ogre. Right. So like, God talk about intimidating. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he, he went on a little bit about GURPS and how they wanted to like approach it from a design sensibility of getting everything, like trying to, trying to accommodate every structure. And he wouldn't necessarily go that direction now. Uh, but right. at the time, at the time, it was a it was uncharted territory, right? Uh, so that's that's really interesting. Like when you're talking about innovative design space, that's uh, that's really neat. But luckily, like I said, I had friends to help, and you know James Ward was very helpful teaching me some stuff. But I have noticed a lot of the games, the rule books are written like they assume you already know things, much like a cookbook assumes you know what oh this cut and that whatever like. Not a lot of them are written for someone who's completely noob. Like I literally just heard of this. Let me try it. Just a pinch of D sixes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> bake your D twenties until golden brown, and then uh, roll right. the dice pool. That should uh, that should be on a t shirt. You, you <laughs> might have your next your next merch idea. But uh, yeah, so I, it's one of the things I I found intimidating about GURPS is, on the one hand, it was plain language as far as the writing style. D and D was a lot more academic. I think the original manuals I've read through some of them the writing style, like um, it was very obvious that the people writing them had large vocabularies, right? Mm. Um, whereas the GURPS had a lot more of a Clancy-esque vibe. It was like, you know, straight to the point kind of approach, I think, with the way it was written. Um, but all of them seemed to assume you knew what the heck you were doing. So I, I like the newer stuff they're doing now in that space where they're, they're making yeah, JR, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. So <laughs> <laughs> you fake it till you make it. That's what you're doing. <laughs> But I, I do like that the newer stuff that's coming out in the, the RPG space seems to understand that you've got to get new people in too. So they make it very easy, I think, for, for new people to approach the hobby. Well, I mean, speaking, putting my developer hat on, like a role-playing game book has to be able to facilitate, kind of serve three masters, right? It, okay. One, it needs to inspire you to buy it and to to play it. It needs to be a springboard for action. That's largely down to art. Is, and two, it needs to instruct you how to play. Like you need to be able to learn how to play by reading the book, even though most people play by word of mouth, like or learn to play by word of mouth. This, the book still needs to be able to do that. And then three, the book needs to be an index to look things up while you're playing, right? But those design sensibilities are all in conflict with each other. Like they all get in the way of each other. Uh, and how do you how do you lay out a page to serve all of those, you know, vindictive masters is a is is a real conflict in development. Um, because I'm sure you've read books that like, oh yeah, I, I learned the book, but then I can't find a darn thing. Right. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so yeah, it's, it depends on how, where you want to lean with your with your layouts and with your design and with the information that you're calling out to try and both, well, all, all three of inspire people to play, teach them how to play, and be a useful reference guide when they are playing. You know, I will so, say that the advent of technology has given you guys the benefit of the search feature on a PDF. 
uh, if people are reading the digital format? I mean, it's been a it's been a blessing and a curse, Jr. Because uh, frankly, the layouts that you would adopt for a page aren't the same as the layouts people should be adopting for digital. People really? just don't read things the same way digitally. Your eye doesn't go in the same directions. But the problem is it costs so much darn money to lay out a page that people tend to lay it out for print and then just kind of hope that it'll work as a PDF and make it interactive and give it bookmarks. But that's not actually making it easy to read. Uh, so I think the industry is going to have to shift towards more uh, of a digital consumption model in order to be able to be better prepared for the future. And, and we're going to see divergent layout paths, I hope, of this is how it's going to be laid out for digital and this is how it's going to be laid out for a print space. Um, sorry, I'm a magazine publisher by day, so this is kind of that's like the world. No, no, this in, is, this is, is to, interesting, yeah. and I think this is the kind of thing that like fans that like these games never really think about, but it's it's fun to think about. I tend to buy the hardcover where available, soft cover where not, to keep in my library because you know if the aliens ever come and drop that EMP, I still want to be able to game right. My dice still work. So yeah, I no, you, you got you got to come up with apocalyptic solutions, you know. Right, like, and so, but then I, I tend to when I'm like making my character because most people, like the the odds of finding someone that plays your niche thing that in your town aren't as good. So you know, I, I game with a lot of people online, and so it's easy to just have the separate tab right with with the manual up, and I can do a quick search if I need to. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. That's something to think about. So. Is that something that they actually did research on or is that something you learned just by being in the business as far as like how an eye reads a page? Well, I mean, it's just all part of layout principle, right? Like um, I, I am a page artist. I do do layout for magazines and um, and I, I've do, I'm doing the layout for my own book. I, I've done layout for other role playing game companies. Um, and that's just one of the one of the things that I've got going. I'm not a very good graphic designer, but I'm a uh, and I'm, I'm a really mediocre high school rule book illustrator. But I've got the page design, I think, down. So uh, <laughs> if you can't be good, be good at it. Well, you so. focus. You focus where you can, right? You put your skill points. You choose your skill points carefully, and uh, and you go from there, right? So this is what happens when I'm not supervised. The rabbit trails can go anywhere. <laughs> but we were doing the religion question, and he mentioned Star Trek, and it was. It was off to the races. It's my own I, fault. It's my own fault. I just you got me impassioned about Star Trek again, and and uh, and away we went. You know, uh, it, it, I I get it. I get it. So because we're a polytheistic podcast, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or Wheel of Time, uh, Lord of the Rings certainly. I'm uh, I'm just part of the problem is I'm just that age. You know, I I grew up reading Lord of the Rings. Um, I have some pretty big criticisms of Game of Thrones uh, and its narrative arc or lack thereof, and. Uh, it's, uh, but Lord of the Rings, what I like most about Lord of the Rings is the fact that from a storytelling perspective, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien does everything, like in terms of a learning perspective, J.R.R. Tolkien is an amateur, right? He's just what you can do if you are an obnoxiously talented, really passionate amateur who devotes an entire world and language to, to his work. Uh, these are the heights that you can go breaking all the rules. And that's, I think that's wonderful. I, it, it's really easy to get swept away on the current of that majesty. All right. And so because uh, you'll see in a second, dear listener, why we're asking this one, because of the topic of your, your RP, um, your role playing game, uh, we've got one extra religion question, the bonus round. Are you ready? I'm, I'm prepared. Yes. Three ninjas, Lionheart, the 1990 Van Damme movie or street fighter from 1994. Um, you know, the Street Fighter movie holds a special place in my heart because I, I was an arcade champ in the early 90s um, and uh, I did compete. Like officially or just beating your neighborhood kids? No, I competed uh, in, in the early 90s in Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition uh, and did quite well for myself. Uh, but But that being said... Lionheart is, I think, an, an often overlooked, wonderful piece of martial arts cinema. And it, it gets foreshadowed by both Kickboxer and Bloodsport, uh, which, which you know, are, are superior in some ways. But Lionheart has a much deeper and more interesting story than, uh, than people often get a, give it credit for. And, you know, you can very easily read Lionheart because it was done with Frank Dukes and Sheldon Lettish uh, as the prologue to Bloodsport that the two cops that are chasing him through Lionheart are just bleed into being the two cops that are chasing him in, uh, in blood sport and, uh, and see them as a kind see it as a kind of prequel and people uh, don't, don't often see it that way, but it's a, uh, but it's an interesting perspective on it. Yeah. I, I like Lionheart a lot. Okay. I, uh, I always had a, I watched the karate. I took karate cause I watched the karate kid as a kid. 
Of course, that was back when it was the uh, what they call you and half of America. Yeah, <laughs> I, I even got the free lesson at the Chuck Norris Dojo. Oh, oh, exciting! Yeah, so you know, yeah, I Although, love Karate Kid. I love Karate Kid. <laughs> that was that was a, the classic one for me with the with the fighting movies. Although uh, I I did like the memes that it, the the counterculture almost that it created where it's like oh no 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 Danny LaRusso was the bad guy and you know the the Cobra Kai were the good guys they were just misunderstood I thought that was hilarious well if I can string this back to the Kickstarter fight to survive uh Cobra Kai the new TV show which does take that angle in many ways taking on Johnny Lawrence's perspective is is kind of a perfect petri dish for the the kind of stories and kind of uh narrative that you can get into in fight to survive because why do people care about Karate Kid uh, they don't care about Karate Kid for the fighting. There's fighting in it, but like they don't care about Karate Kid for the fighting. They care about Karate Kid for the context. They care about why they're fighting. They care about uh, what's the setup for the fight. You know, when when Daniel Larusso raises his leg into the crane kick, you know, everybody goes, "Oh, this is you know, this is a great moment." But if this kid raising his leg, uh, why does it matter? Well, it matters because of the hour and a half you just watched beforehand, uh, making sense of it and, and giving it meaning. And that's the purpose behind Fight to Survive. It was to give things meaning, uh, to give these fights context and to uh, make them meaningful. That was okay. my segue. It's not bad. <laughs> Almost like you've done this before. Oh, you know, a time or two. Yeah. So uh, we here at the Blasters and Blades, we like both the fantastical and the scientific. So what was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Um, I'm going to be a, a tad unconventional for people among my generation and say that my first love was definitely science fiction. Uh, I grew up reading a lot of um, science fiction paperbacks. I don't know why, just whatever I had access to, like H.G. Wells, I had a lot of access to. Um, uh, Samuel R. Delaney, uh, I really loved. Um, the uh, Canadian golden age science fiction giant A.E. Van Vaught, who fell oh. out of big favor after uh, Damon Knight, obviously, with his pygmy and the typewriter. Uh, exclamation but uh still i loved a.e van vaught and his dreamlike qualities um you know a lot of frederick fole uh larry niven a lot of the golden age stuff and a lot of the like uh the 70s new wave uh paperbacks were mostly what i would read mind you i i i love fantasy too you know and i love the places where they intersect like rogers lasney um, you know, and I love some of the, the planetary romance stuff, like the Edgar Rice Burroughs stories of John Carter uh, on Barsoom. And like those have all informed my imagination in various ways. But uh, I probably read more science fiction than most people I know who uh, who are more prone to fantasy. So sometimes I feel like a bit of an outlier uh, trying to plug them on the latest science fiction, uh, like um, the fifth season, for instance, or Auxiliary Mercy uh, or the uh, the expanse series uh but i think there's still a lot of really great stuff happening in science fiction and uh people should be more involved in in the science fiction of today as much as i'm also stuck in yesterday you know it's uh it's i try a happy to... medium somewhere yep so what was your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction was it reading the the works the classic works of science fiction or was it you know did you find it on television watching star trek or what was your i mean it's, i mean if i'm being honest with myself it's almost certainly watching star trek um yeah, it's probably my earliest science fiction is watching star trek i have a, a a very distinct memory of i think it was about around about 1989 when the cage first aired unedited uh, so it wasn't the menagerie parts one and two it was it was the original pilot of star trek the cage and i remember television building it up a lot uh, at the time, and it was, I didn't realize when I, I was just a kid, I was like, I don't know, eight or nine or something, and I, I didn't realize that was the first time it was airing, and I remember it blowing my mind, uh, and that was probably the moment at which I, I really got into science fiction, was watching The Cage. I think that's a, maybe a strange entry point, but it's, uh, it's, um, it was meaningful at the time. It's as valid as any other. So what is it about science fiction that you love so much as a genre? Uh, what I love most about science fiction is the fact that, um, well, you know, I'm not sure emotional nuance was easy for me as a kid, uh, honestly. Like, I remember watching the Ghostbusters and I couldn't tell anybody apart. Uh, I was like, oh, I don't know. There's a guy in a jumpsuit and a guy in a jumpsuit and a guy in a jumpsuit and, and Ernie Hudson. Uh, so it was <laughs> sometimes challenging for me to, to decipher, decipher what was going on. But I always knew that I had Star Trek where... Uh, it was clear who everybody was. The bald guy was the captain, and the guy with the beard was the second officer, and the the android was was you know operations. And Jordy has a visor, and and Worf is the client. So it was easy to understand what was going on. And 
when you have kind of representative stakes through science fiction and you're dealing with moral quandaries, I found that a lot more appealing than relationships, than character relationships as a kid. Sure. So um, <clears throat> now I'm much more concerned with character. But at the time, uh, I, I really wanted situations and to dissect and disseminate situations. Uh, and that's what attracted me to science fiction is because there's an inherent interest in the situation that's going on, be it through the dilemma that's established or the world that is uh, that you're supposed to explore. Okay, so I'm going to preface this next question by saying that you're a game designer and games have stories in them too. The ones you tell through the backstory of the various settings that you create and the, the ones that you build the scaffolding for, for the players to then create their own story. So how did you transition from being a lover of speculative fiction writ large to creating content in that space in the form of games and, and other media? Well, it's all the same nerd stuff, right? Like, um, it's, you know, like I, I loved comic books too, right? And, uh, and I loved uh, dumb movies. And for me, making this game specifically, because I've made quite a few games, is was about, I, there was a lot of motivations feeding into this, but for me it was, uh, why aren't these stories appreciated? Um, you know, people would people say, "Oh, action movies—they got dumb plots, and they've got dumb lines, and they've got bad acting." But my my sentiment was always, "Well, yeah, but there's a lot more to them, like beyond the dumb plots and the bad acting, and uh, and there's a lot to discover, and there's a lot to appreciate." And I think in the same way, science fiction and fantasy are often maligned. Oh, it's just dumb dragon stuff, or oh, it's just dumb sword stuff, or oh, they just have laser guns and Buck Rogers and whatever. No, there's a lot going on there. Uh, but it, it takes a different mindset to appreciate the structures and the tropes and uh, the nuance of, of what is going on. And that led me directly into establishing niche structures within tabletop role-playing games. Like what, what about this genre is unique? What about it can we appreciate? And what about it can we bring out and capitalize on in play? So just as I have a love of science fiction and discovering new worlds there, uh, I wanted people to be able to discover new worlds in tabletop role-playing games that they've never played before and that they never could have played before. Okay. That is an acceptable and in-depth answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> so many authors and creators let their own real-life experiences influence the way they create content. So were there any specific formidable moments that you think shaped you into the storyteller you became? Well, in terms of fight to survive, yeah, I got into a lot of fights. Um, I grew up scrappy, and because uh, uh, I grew up in a small rural town, uh, and I had to defend myself a lot, and I got into a lot of fights. Um, and it sucks. It's lousy. Like uh, you know, you were in the military. You know what fighting is like. Uh, it's it's a harrowing, upsetting experience. And uh, I kind of wanted to take that harrowing, upsetting experience. And uh, deal with it in a different way, because like I'm, I'm a big. You, you can't tell how tall I am, but I'm like six four. You know, I'm. I, I at one point I was very fit in my life. I have now firmly given unto the dad body, uh, but I was fit for a while there. And um, I wanted to take with the experience I feel of. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to take the experience of getting into a fight and actually do something with it, because in a role playing game, uh, I was never satisfied with how fighting let alone martial arts, was depicted in a role-playing game. I'm going to get into a little bit of a diatribe here, sorry. Uh, but Ninjas and Super Spies by Eric Wujic is a really good example of a role-playing game text. It's under the champion system that's very in-depth. But it's so in-depth, you would need to know martial arts in order to know how to play, really, from a tactical perspective. Like, yeah, you can just learn champions. But like, uh, in order to really understand what he's on about, because he was a, a martial arts enthusiast, you need to know quite a bit about the martial arts. I really don't want players coming into a system feeling like they have to get a PhD in order to be able to play it. Uh, I, I want to develop games that are intuitive, that make sense, uh, and that people can not pick up and play, but, you know, because we can have more investment than that, but uh, that people can come to without having to have prior knowledge. So I wanted to develop a game that would both feel like fighting where you're making the kind of choices you're making in fighting, the kind of hard, tough, gritty choices from fighting. I wanted a game where you could come to it not knowing martial arts, but if you did know martial arts, it would give you something of a, of a, a deeper appreciation. And uh, on the other side of things, I wanted to make a game where it would just, uh, like where it would feel relevant or that would feel relevant. So that's 
that's how I got there. Sorry, I'm going off on all these tangents on you. You are fine. That was actually <laughs> interesting. I'm just adjusting some of my questions because you're answering some, but it's cool. This is normal. I'm sorry. I'm a so, wild animal. I can't be contained. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. So transitioning a little bit, and then we're going to dive deep into the game. But from a writing side, let's look at things from a fan angle. So have you gotten any cool fan art or cosplay of your, your cre creations yet? Well, I mean, I, I did work for Pendlehaven Press in uh, in Montreal, actually, which I understand you've been some something close to, uh, yeah. which is another <laughs> Canadian uh, tabletop role-playing game publisher. Uh, they do a game called Fate of the Norns. It's a Viking game where you pull runes out of a bag in order to resolve your conflicts rather than using dice. It's very exciting. It's very to theme. Uh, and you can check it out on fateofthenorns.com. So I did a bunch of work for Fate of the Norns. And when I was at Gen Con, the last time that it happened, no, not the last time it happened, pre-pandemic, I was at Gen Con running games of Fate of the Norns and somebody showed up to the table in full Viking regalia and sat down and I, I offered him some runes to play with and he said, no, I brought my own. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, I am interested enough that I'm going to make that a show note and we will look that up and see if I can't throw Fate of the Norns to, uh, to people to look into as well. Yeah, you should. Andrew Vilsakis is a great guy, and uh, Fate of the Norns is, is a great system. Uh, Ed Greenwood is doing some work for them right now in a, their recent Kickstarter, which is the Athleath box set. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's definitely worth looking up. It's a lot of fun. I will have to get with you offline, and we will see if we can't get them on the show, too, because that <laughs> sounds interesting. I've never heard of one where they didn't use dice. So Yeah, well, it, it enhances the experience of what you're doing when you have to weird that's the, to pull the runes. You have to weird runes from a bag in order to determine what kind of... It's more or less like a resource system. It's more like playing Magic the Gathering in some ways. Like you're dealing okay. with... Uh, like once you put your runes out on... You get to assemble them into different formations uh, that make sense according to play to represent how what your character is doing and the powers your character has. Uh, and it takes... It replaces dice completely. And it's, uh, it's a very exciting system. So yeah, I, I would suggest checking it out. Andrew's going to be so, happy I plugged the game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm interested. It, it sounds interesting. I, I do find Viking. So anybody that knows anything about modern military, especially American military, knows that, um, you know, they used to say back in the day, a fiddler's green for the cavalry where they go to uh, regroup when they die. And, and, and my experience in the military was always until Valhalla, right? Like, we'll see you again when we lost our friends. Regardless of what your in, um, individual faith background might be. And so, like, because of that, it got me thinking, and I was always curious, you know, like, I, I remember watching the Thor movie as a kid. Um, he even appeared in some babysitter show with my sisters watched, like. Uh, so, oh, Adventures in Babysitting, yeah, played, yeah, by, yeah. Uh, played by the guy who is currently the kingpin, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah, that was a young Vincent D'Onofrio. So I've Thor. always been interested a little bit in Viking culture, so I think that game, it's just like, oh, Okay. Let me look into this. I'll, I, you've got my interest. But uh, so back to you. I'm selling the wrong game here. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> we're here to talk about your stuff. <laughs> Has anybody ever asked for your autograph? Um, I did. I did. I've done a number of book signings. Uh, and so I've I've done through there from the books that I published previously, the role playing game books I published previously. Uh, so I've, I've given out autographs there and at con conventions when I'm when I'm peddling role-playing games at conventions people have asked for my signature then uh i don't think anybody's ever asked for my signature beyond the art of it or the you know the product of it but yeah in so baby steps baby steps you gotta start somewhere so what was the first time you got a, someone asked for your signature like do you remember yeah i remember i was at a book signing uh i was I, like I'll, I'll mention his name again i was beside ed greenwood because we had just taken a 12-hour car ride to get to montreal I, think, I don't know if it was actually 12 hours. It just felt like 12 hours. And I, I spent the whole time pestering him nervously about what his days at TSR were like. And so he and I were, were beside each other in a Montreal like chocolatier uh, signing the books because we co-written a, a book together. And um, and I remember the people, somebody got Ed's signature and, and then they passed the book to me and were like, can I get your signature too? And I remember thinking like, why? What, why? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it it was so it was a very strange experience for me. But I like was like oh, I, I just and then the, the thought was well I don't want to ruin this book by writing in it. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like in the uh, in the traditional or not traditional in the regular novel 
format world of writing, you would be what we call the and more and many more or and more on an anthology. You know, you got the headliners and then and many more. Like that's that's still where I'm at in the in the writing phase. It sounds like you were there. Yeah, well, that's that's where I was with with Ed. Yeah, Ed would write the like it was a it was called Creatures from Fairy Tale and Myth, and it was the kind of storybook uh, before the publisher repackaged the material to be game material. Uh, and so he got Ed to do these fantastic stories about these monsters, and I was doing all the like background research and structuring that would be uh, for the game relevant for the game mechanics. So it'd be like, uh, you know, the Oogburton does this and is known for this and was known from these tales, and like I got to do that stuff, and then Ed got to do the colorful uh, fiction stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, and, a, and a girl, a wonderful girl named Michelle, also got to supplement Ed's writing with some of her. Uh, some of her fic on the fiction side so it ended up being three of us but um it was a good experience and uh i had a great time signing signing my name at a chocolatier uh, <laughs> that was the first it's, time. it's always uh amazing to hear people who were involved with tsr in the beginning I've, I've gotten to talk to james ward a lot about that I, I wonder if they knew back then how much of a difference they were making on culture when they were creating dungeons and dragons in the early days i mean from everything that i've heard um they couldn't have known because they were so busy doing it right they were right. just so busy like they were i'm sure they were going to work every day thinking i get to do this <laughs> let's right. do this wait you're gonna uh, pay me for this you know, you're gonna pay me for this like let's do this and uh um from some of the stories that i've heard you know the, the living conditions for people working at, at tsr weren't necessarily great you know a lot of them lived in like flop houses together because that's the only way they could afford rent because like geneva is very expensive uh and so they their life was their work right they basically lived at work because there was there wasn't much of a home to go home to uh and you know i keep thinking that's exactly what i would have done like yeah. i was in my 20s and you let me work on a fantasy property of any kind i just I'd live at work. Sure. Let's do this. You can make a lot of choices that you uh, early in life that you can't make as you grow and have families. And so why not? Yeah. There, there are doors that are closed. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. So um, since you've started creating content, have you ever spotted one of your books in the wild? Yes, but it's cheating because there are only so many uh, tabletop role playing game stores in Canada. 50% uh, of the population of Canada is in Ontario. I'm in Ontario. Uh, and 50% of the population of Ontario is in Toronto. I'm not in Toronto, but I'm just outside Toronto. So if you go to a few key uh, gaming stores in Toronto, my books are in there. But, uh, you know, it, it, most of the Canadian industry would, would, would be in those places. But it's nice to see it out in the, see them out in the wild. I went to a TAG event one time, a Toronto area gaming uh, thing, and saw one of my books being played, and it wasn't, had nothing to do with me. And I was like, oh, that's... That's lovely. I'm too embarrassed to walk over there. I'll just go the other way. Uh, so it's uh, it, it does happen, but uh, but we are talking about a much smaller pool, you know, with with Canadian. Take uh, the win stuff. wherever you can get. It. I'll take the win. I'll take the win. I'm happy about it. I'll, I'll so it. Uh, finally, the last of the fandom questions that Doc lovingly created because she's a fandom nerd. Um, what is the weirdest or funniest interaction with fans you've had since you started uh, creating content? Uh, the weirdest or funniest interaction I've had with fans. Um, I mean, I, I did run a game of Fate of the Norns one time where, like, like beyond the fellow showing up with his own runes, because that was, like, not uncommon <laughs> that at a convention game somebody would show up with their own runes. Not not often in, like, full braided beard and, and you know, uh, historically inaccurate horned helmet, but, uh, but people did show up. <laughs> People did show up taking runes uh, very seriously as a kind of, uh, uh, I had one guy who showed up and, and he was treating it as a kind of divination and was convinced that every time he worded his runes for his character, it meant different things for his life. And uh, I had to I had to calm the guy down at one point and be like, buddy, like, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's all have fun let's let's just Method concentrate acting. having fun and like it's well i was never quite sure where that line was you know if he was uh if he was just really really gung-ho you know into what was going on or if or if he was doing a, a bit or uh if he was uh if he was a little bit concerned about his divine fate under the runes uh but yeah that's that's the way Smile it goes. Wave, boys. well Smile people wave. people make their own fun right people have different right. fun they have different kinds of fun. I don't want to discourage anybody. They're fun. No, nope, you know? there's no such thing as wrong fun if it's legal and consensual. No, no bad wrong fun. 
Yeah. All right. So normally we would pause right now uh, before we start talking about the product itself and shamelessly show for the man. But the man is sitting right here. Mr. James Kerr is sponsoring this episode. So uh, we'll just keep talking about your product since that's what we're here for anyway. Damn the torpedoes. Full speed, full speed ahead. ahead. Absolutely. So this is the part where we talk about everything you, James Kerr, have created. So can you give us the, the Reader's Digest version of uh, your body of works? And I am told saying Reader's Digest ages me. I mean, is it still around the Reader's Digest? I don't know. Okay, right. <laughs> I had a younger reader or listener who listens with his dad emailed the show and he's like, what's Reader's Digest? Like, I mean, oh you God, could slightly contemporize know. yourself and say Cole's Notes or I guess the Wikipedia version. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what have I published? I published, I think, five or six books for Pendlehaven Press. Um, I, I ran the gambit of doing writing, uh, editing, uh, layout work. And for the last... Uh, what did I do? I did a bunch of adventures and I did a bunch of uh, bestiaries. And the last book that I did was a core rule book called Children of Eru, uh, which was the Celtic setting for the fate of the Norns universe. Uh, so it takes things a little bit farther south. And for that, I was the project manager of, uh, of, of it. I ended up kind of being the editor of it. Uh, I managed to snag some development credit because I managed to develop a, a few of the rules and structures. Uh, did quite a bit of writing for it and I did the layout. Uh, so that was kickstarted a year and a half ago or a bit. Uh, it ended up being a massive project. We wanted it to be like 220 pages and it was like 440 pages. Uh, oh but uh, no, it was, it was, it was a big one. Uh, so that's kind of what propelled me into James, uh, into, into Radio James Games was, um, well, I've already done it all uh, and I'm a publisher during the day and there's not much more that I can do with Pendlehaven and I've got all these games that I uh i'd wanted to put out for my own uh so i was like okay well we'll just we'll just do this on my own and that's what led me to fight to survive so uh if you want to check it out you can probably just type in james kerr into drive through rpg and see a big list uh not that big of a list you know a list uh and otherwise if you want to check out this game you can go to radiojamesgames.com or look up radio james games on discord and we have a facebook page as well so with the um with the uh, the Celtic version of the New Orleans games, was that different runes, or did it um, use the same rune set for the? It uses the same rune set, but that was only because I was worried about people. I didn't want people to feel like we were just trying to rig more dollars out of them. I thought right. about converting the whole thing to an Ogham uh, set, which is kind of the. I mean, it, the sometimes used specifically Irish Druid form of communicating by carving into sticks and uh, sometimes carving onto stones. Uh, and Ogham script is, is very interesting, but it wasn't going to offer the diversity of possibilities that were afforded by the Elder Futhark rune set that we did use for Fate of the Norns. And ultimately we decided, let's just stick to the runes because we don't want people feeling like, oh, they have to buy this big book and they have to invest in a rune bag. Whereas Elder Futhark runes are fairly common. Like even if you don't um, get get some from Pendlehaven, you can still, you know, you can still get some. You can you can make some with clay. You can you can do it that way. Uh, but with a full Ogham set, it would have it would have been a whole new structure. So uh, of the things that I regret artistically, you know, I could have I could have stuck to my guns and been like, no, we're going with Ogham. It's going to be wonderful. But uh, but I, I compromise who went out of food talk. Okay. And we'll, uh, we'll link all the things in the show notes. He is going to get us all of his social medias. And if you like gaming and you like nerding out over all the cool things, then uh, his, his show notes will show you what to buy. But uh, <laughs> while all of that sounds fascinating, we didn't bring you here to talk about Vikings, although Vikings are awesome. Uh, we brought you here to talk about your Kickstarter, the uh, fight to survive. So one of the things that makes rpg manuals fun is the art um so what kind of art did you go um with for the source book what can they expect and then once you answer so we don't color the audience i will show some of the art that i snagged from your kickstarter sorry trying to give a sense of my what's on my green screen here uh we were blessed we were blessed with a fantastic artist named ian mclean who has worked in the industry for about 20 years. He's done uh, material for Pathfinder, for Call of Cthulhu, and for a lot of little indie games. Uh, and he and I knew each other already, and I had him in mind since before I even started writing this game. So it was a really good, uh, it was a really good pairing, and I'm so blessed that we're working so well together to try and present uh, some exciting, dynamic, energy-filled art uh, that really communicates 
the genre tropes and uh, what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, so that's that's the art. I'm being a little bit stingy on art because uh, there's there's a bunch of it on the Kickstarter, on the Kickstarter page, and uh, we've been leading images all around, but there's a lot more to come. Obviously, and we want people to uh, to participate to to get involved in that. So I am going to share the art I stole shamelessly from your Kickstarter for this. Uh, so this is, if you go to the Kickstarter, this is the image that you will see on the Kickstarter. And if you I had zoomed out a little bit for it, you'd have seen the, you know, subscribe here. And you guys are close to funding, which is good because that uh, makes it a stronger investment. So people have to be less leery. Yeah, we've got 12 days to go and we're at 77% at the time of this recording. So we're fine. Uh, I've got stretch goals to, to bail out next week. So everybody is, is in for a lot of uh, treats and twists. And uh, I've got a few tricks up my sleeve left. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely funding, and it's it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of fund when we fund. Um, and so some of the is this oh that didn't eh. oh those are the tears if you really want. you got some tears although it's Canadian dollars so it's kind of funny money for our American listeners you got to do the math and figure it out so. Actually, well, you might I mean, be better off with your dollar than ours. I really don't know. I'm just trying to be funny. No, no. All uh, you have to do is just knock a bit off. I think I think twelve dollars Canadian is around ten dollars American. You know, sixteen is like fourteen. Twenty-two is like nineteen or so, somewhere around there. Yeah. So for fifteen dollars, you're buying a digital uh, source book and helping you know get a fun game. Uh, Twenty-two, and like I said, it's Canadian. You get the hardcover, or well, at least the print cover um, plus, and then you can you know go all the way up to getting a limited um, fighter added to the game, although it looks like those were all filled. Those ones are all filled. The, the, you still have an opportunity in the add-ons to contribute stages and to contribute opponents to the book, uh, but the, <laughs> the five special uh, characters that are out in the forefront, those are occupied now, but uh, there are other ways to contribute. There are other ways to get involved. And so we have the some of the look at some of the art. I'm guessing this is the cover image that's going to go on the book, or at <laughs> least that's what they got now. Yeah, that's the cover uh, image. And then in behind are some of the page layouts uh, from the quick start. And then he's got a list uh, that I got. So, you know, I, the art is obviously limited on a Kickstarter. Be oh, let me zoom in real quick. The art is limited on the Kickstarter because, you know, most of the time that gets funded afterwards or paid for afterwards. But, I mean, those, those characters, that definitely looks Street Fighter to me. I, I see it. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, the fighters are meant to communicate a lot of attitude. I don't want uh, the kind of meta-narrative characters to be the heroes, so to speak. Uh, it's all about the characters that you create as players, uh, and the mechanics are there to support that and bring those characters to the forefront of life in the environment that's set up a fight to survive. But just to give you a sense of the kind of dynamic characters that you can create, like, yes, they're all martial artists. Yes, it's all mundane. It's very down to earth. It's very close to home, low stakes, personal and gritty, but you can still make a dynamic range of characters as displayed by all of these guys, which are just the kind of playtest group from the year uh, 1985. Okay. So I, I, I dig the art. Um, is there any plans at some point where people can get some of that art as like posters and merch and stuff? Because, I mean, I could see some of that going up on somebody's wall art in a man cave. Yeah, well, I mean, I could talk with Ian about it. Like he's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's good. I, I really, I'm really enjoying the art too. If you play the video, uh, I managed to stuff most of the art or, or even the test art into the video to just to give people a sense of where we are in terms of development, uh, because the art is the farthest, uh, is the thing that takes the longest because it's the thing that uh, is most laborious perhaps. Uh, you know, I come from publishing, so the editorial is already done uh, and it's been done for a while. And the game has been out and play tested since like 2015. Uh, so it's been, it's been out in the wilds of like convention land for quite a while. It's just a case of nailing this art and making it gorgeous and getting these pages laid out so that they serve those three masters we talked about earlier, that they inspire you to play, that they teach you how to play, and they act as a handy reference when you go to play. So, you know, I take the um, simple approach to, to life. When I need a skill, I learn a skill. I don't go out inventing things to learn that take my time away from the other things. Uh, and so I have never had to download a video before, so I don't know how. I'm going to have to learn. <laughs> Uh, cause there are other people who have made video commercials and I keep thinking that would be kind of cool and StreamYards will let me show it. So I've got to figure out how to, how to save that stuff. But, um, but Hey, we're going to have the link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. And if they go there, they can watch it themselves. 
It's. Ex- I mean, I, I got to be really geeky in the video and and use some of my. I, dumber, I enjoyed watching. It. I, I, I did enjoy the radio voice. It was. It's most impressive. One day I will get that good. Oh, I mean, I mean, it's it's just a, spending enough time in front of a, a you know a better microphone than. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's all it was uh but but thank i have you been guys. told i have a a voice or was it i have a face for radio and a voice for print so i mean i, I get it <laughs> but um so moving on to the game itself what would be your 30 second elevator pitch for fight to survive well my 30 second elevator pitch has usually been uh think of mouse guard meets jean claude van damme's blood sport okay has been my one line. Um, you know, I could have I could have chosen another direction. I could have said like, uh, think Blades in the Dark meets Karate Kid. You know, uh, I I could uh, say that it's a it's a diceless game where you compare your moves, uh, and the heart of the game matters as much as the fighting of the game. There we go. That's about, it's like three elevator pitches, three business card pitches. I, I will take it. So. What do you mean when you say you compare your moves in the heart of it matters more? Because I'm used to games where you roll a dice or in some cases you flip a, a deck of, you know, even just playing cards and they'll have systems built around that. So so what is the engine behind this that allows you to say, oh, my move connected and yours didn't? Well, not to go too far down a rabbit hole, but every character has five moves. Everybody has the same five moves. And it comes from a it was more or less inspired by a Bruce Lee quote that he did on the Pierre Burton show in like 1972, I think. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it's unless human beings have six arms and six legs, they fight like human beings. So on that basis, the moves for each character are uh, grapple, punch, kick, block, and footwork. And they fi- form a kind of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, so kick beats punch, but punch beats grapple, but grapple beats kick. And then the uh, the defensive moves, block and footwork, have a little bit more of a complex relationship. But uh, there's a little chart in the middle of the character sheet, so it's easy to see. It's uh, quick to get used to what those relationships are with the moves. Typically, after one game, a one sit-down game, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I, I know. I, I've got it square. When you start a round, you pick a few moves, usually three, and then you can issue those moves in any order that you like in a kind of call and response. So if, JR, if we're getting into a fight, and I'm a kickboxer, so I know that I've got a really good kick, and I really want to kick you. And uh, let's say that you're you're practicing karate, so you know that you're really good at block, and I know you're really good at block. Uh, I might prep some moves like punch, kick, and, and maybe kick again, and then you would prep your moves. And then I would say, well, I'm going to kick, and then you would respond with something that might trump that, and then I would respond with something accordingly, and then we, we would keep going until we ran out of moves and then see who got hit. So that's the kind of uh, Reader's Digest version of the fight mechanic. The heart does it. Does that make sense, or can I move on? Can I move no, on? I, to the heart? I did have I did have one quick question. Okay. So when you say the call and response, do you have to like I'm going to do this, this, and this, and you pre pre write that before you know what the other guy's going to do, or do you go back and forth? You go back and well, you pre write the selection of moves. They don't have to be in that order, but you pre-write the selection of moves. Like I, I think I'll pump, I think I'll grapple, I'll think I'll do footwork because I want to get a, make sure I can get away. And then you call and response one after the other so you can change your mind on the order that you issue the moves as, you, as you're ordering them. You just have to cross them off as they're issued. So it's really easy to play over Discord <laughs> because you just write things down and then you just cross them off as you go. So it sounds like much like there's a lot of cards in a deck, you only have so many in your hand and that's what you're playing from. And you um, kind of, ex- except it doesn't need cards. Like you can, you can do I'm it. I'm just pretty, using that as a visual. Uh, for yeah. Yeah. No, no. V- visually you could easily be like, I'm going to play my punch card that uses my punch card, uh, but I've got another punch card. I only use my other punch card. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a visual representation that works very well. Okay. So what is it you think that makes your game fight to survive special? Well, I think oh, no, the- no, you're you're going to talk about the heart. I, I'll first. just, I'll just, I'll just use that, right, uh, Jerry? I'll, I guess I'd say my, the heart mechanic makes it special, which is uh, every character has a harm track, which, like, like you would imagine, if your harm track fills up and you die, or you, you know, get grievously injured enough that you can't participate. But everybody also has a hardship track, which measures your emotional stress. So you lost your job, you get a hardship. You know, you, your dog ran away, you get a hardship. Your wife left, you get a hardship, et cetera, et cetera. And if that hardship track fills up, you uh, leave the martial world. You decide, I am not going to pursue this lifestyle of violence any longer. And uh, you leave Metro City and you go off 
to be a monk or to wander the world or do whatever, do whatever it is you, you, you're going to do off camera. Uh, to prevent your hardship track from filling up, what you have are your comforts, which are the people, places, and things that are important to you. And each of those have a numerical value. So I might have a comfort like uh, my girlfriend, Cindy, uh, or and I might have a place like Riva's Diner that uh, is like a 1950s style chrome diner where two of the letters are uh, haven't been blinking out for the last 10 years and the pie is really great. And I might have a thing like a fancy sports car, for instance. So when I'm not fighting, when, you, when you're getting into a fight and pursuing this violent lifestyle, you're getting hardship as well as as injury because it's it's a it's a harrowing experience and then you've got to deal with that hardship so i might go to reva's diner and get some pie and knowing that i've got three in reva's diner it reduces three hardship from my hardship track and keeps me from going crazy but these are established on little plateaus both health and hardship are established on plateaus so like if i get up to stressed out or if i get out to just snapped or if i get out to, up to head an episode you know then uh, things are dramatic uh, do you remember Bloodsport very well, JR? I, I know I talk about Bloodsport probably too much. But... I've seen it, but it's been a couple of years. <clears throat> okay, so we'll see if you can remember this scene. There was a scene in Bloodsport where Jean-Claude Van Damme is on the bus. He's on the bus in Hong Kong. God knows why he's on the bus. And uh, it's playing Stan Bush's On My Own, like a dorky love song in the background. And he's kind of troubled because the the bad guy, uh, played by Bolo Ling, he's, he's uh, just defeated Jean-Claude Van Damme or Frank Dukes' friend Jackson and broken his leg and the guy's in the hospital. And so Jean-Claude Van Damme's on the bus and he's looking in the reflection of the mirror and he sees his enemy in the reflection and looks over on the other seat and no, no, he's not actually there. And I remembered watching that and thinking, why doesn't a role-playing game do that? Why can't we have emotional relevance to the structure of fights? Because you can make a game that, that where two people just meet and they fight and then you resolve it. The problem is that lacks uh, substance. There's quite there's quite a few of those games. I'm not going to judge anybody for their fun. Like people have lots of fun doing things, but what I was interested in was developing a game where that has meaning. So we talked about the martial arts mechanics. We talked about comforts. The structure of the game is that every game, those things that you chose as comforts are what is on the chopping block. So your girlfriend Cindy, she's been kidnapped. Your sports car, it's been stolen. Your Riva's diner. <clears throat> excuse me, the landlord uh, wants to sell the property and bulldoze it and put up a Walmart. So uh, how do you overcome these challenges? Well, you end up eventually, you end up uh, delving into violence because that's what's rewarded. But with the recognition that that is also what is uh, causing your character hardship and uh, it creates a kind of tension of violence and the responsibility of violence at play in the martial world that uh, uh, in, as you as you play along with your character. So that's what makes the game special. It's also multi-generational. So every play session represents about one to three years of play. Uh, so as you get older, you're going to get frailer, but you're going to be more skilled. And there comes a certain point at which you may not want to continue with your character because they've had grievous injury for too long. You know, that that pit fight they got into in 1933 uh, with the barbed wire fence just never healed quite right. And uh, you know, the, it's, it's been troubling them on their character sheet, it stuck around or they're just not able to escape the hardship. You know, after somebody crashed their sports car in a joyride and they weren't able to get it back and they got all the hardship, uh, they were never able to overcome it. So they might want to pass on their mantle of their martial lineage to their son or daughter or um, to their student or to someone else to carry on instead of them. So you end up kind of navigating a martial arts lineage throughout the 20th century. Okay. So one of the things that a lot of the, a lot of the games that, um, or excuse me, a lot of the fight movies that I've seen and you're the, that inspired this game, uh, they had a lot of things. Oh, well, that was a cheap shot. You can't do that. You know, like when, when Cobra Kai, you know, swept, you know, hurt, tried to hurt Danny LaRusso, for instance. Oh, he was yeah, taking a cheap leg. shot. Yeah. Sweep the leg. So is there any of that um, mechanically built into the game or thematically allowed to fit into the game? For your players if you've got someone who wants to play the archetype of the bad guy oh absolutely case. yeah i mean i'm a big proponent of the fact that i mean people often uh um, advocate for free foreign games with very few rules on the basis that quote you can do anything my retort to that is uh if you if it doesn't have mechanical reinforcement it doesn't exist because 
yeah, you can do anything. You can do anything you want on hand-wavy downtime activities, but if you want people to play a certain way and you want people to uh, be directed towards uh, something that's thematic according to what your design goals were, then it needs to have mechanical reinforcement. So things like that uh, absolutely are embedded into the game. Like if somebody says, you know, you're in a bar and you're going to get into a bar fight because somebody is harassing the waitress and you decide to stand up for the waitress and you walk up to them and you know you're going to get into a fight, you would get three moves and they would get three moves. But if you want to shift things mechanically in your advantage, you might say, well, I'm going to go into my pocket and I'm going to pick out my car keys. And I'm going to throw my car keys in the air to dazzle him. And then when he looks up, I'm going to punch him in the nose. Oh, so, so, so misdirection is an option. Absolutely. So mechanically, you would just get one more move. So now you have four moves and they have three moves. So it's become, become substantially harder right out of the gate for them to overcome the moves that you present. Um, so then, similarly, if you, uh, you know, are going down a blind alley and, uh, and you're overcome by a gang who's, who's ganged up on you, uh, it's the same structure. It's, it's, it's easy to resolve uh, large-scale fights like uh, Bruce Lee in uh, Fist of Fury when he goes into the Japanese dojo and uh, beats up all the karate guys. Uh, you know, the game easily handles large groups of people in one sequence of moves so that it's easy to do one versus many or two versus many or et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it, it sounds like there's more structure to this game than I originally thought. So are, is there a role for uh, a character for like a dungeon master, game master, whatever you call it? Yeah, there is there is a GM. But what the GM does is largely, I mean, they kind of do two things. They prep opponents beforehand and then they call a comfort to be under threat. Uh, so like, oh, your girlfriend Cindy has been kidnapped. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a letter on your bed. It says, uh, you know, dear Johnny, I love you, but uh, I'm running away with uh, Raven, the River City gang leader, signed Cindy. And you're like, hey, that's not Cindy's handwriting. And so you go and investigate what's going on with that. And you end up fighting with the River City gang leader and having a, uh, a sledgehammer fight in the middle of the street. As you know, as, as, as you do, as a GM, I'm running the bad guys. <clears throat> They're all pre-prescribed, so I can just throw them out. Uh, it's easy to prep. I, I love the game. I love running. I love the game, but I love running the game specifically because it's really easy for me to run. <laughs> it's a lot of work uh, to run because people, uh, characters have their comforts and those comforts connect. So you might have Cindy as a girlfriend, but the person beside you at the table might have Cindy as their sister. And uh, you might love Reva's diner, but somebody else at the at the table might be the cook for Rena's, Reva's diner. So when these threats are under, uh, when these comforts are under threat, you guys are rallying around, like that's the motivation, the drive to action of why you're rallying around. I don't have to do much as a GM. I just have to put things under threat and then deal with the repercussions and adjudicate things as they come up and people uh, scheme all the heck, you know, because they do. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoy the, I'm a forever GM anyway, but uh one of my design considerations was I wanted this to be easy to run. <laughs> <laughs> that That's fair. So is there ever a, a scenario where you have player, table player versus table player fighting, or are they always cooperative? No, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there are circumstances where table versus table player fighting. Like I, um, in a, a fairly recent uh, game, somebody, they were on a boat and the one player character suspected that one of the other player characters comforts was a murderer. And so was trying to crash into their room and the other, the other player character was trying to prevent them from doing so. And they ended up getting into a fight. Uh, it definitely happens. It's, it's not like a, you know, let's get these guys together and kill each other kind of game. Um, if you really wanted to, you could do that, I guess. But uh, uh, there's a lot more emotional complexity to what's going on with these characters uh, than, than that. Because the thing is, I didn't want this to be just one shot fodder. This game gets richer the more you play it. So you might have a comfort of Cindy uh, and you start playing like, let's say the 1940s, like 1943 or something. And uh, next year, you know, Cindy might have something happen to her. So the comfort might be under threat. Uh, as it rotates around, different comforts will be under threat. But like, as the years go by, you have more and more of a history with Cindy. And these characters, these NPCs and these NPC places take on meaning. 
and the history that you have there becomes richer and richer. Like, oh yeah, Riva's Diner, you know, in, in 1952, we, we defended that from the, uh, the Aces gang who came in and busted up the window. And boy, was Riva mad that we ended up throwing a guy through a window. And oh yeah, you know, but it ended up closing in 1973 after that fire. So as you as you go on, like the world that you're living in, you're building it as players, like as a gym, I don't have to do any of that. As players, they're building it as they go in a way that is mechanically relevant and doesn't feel arbitrary. I, I've got to admit, Jer, I'm not a big fan of story games because uh, they always feel a little bit anchorless. And in terms of verisimilitude, I want to be able to inhabit a character and just think about what my character is thinking. And uh, really try and tighten that conceptual space around the character. Uh, but I hesitate to use the word story, but just by virtue of playing in Fight to Survive, a narrative develops of these fights and this violence and the horrible repercussions of violence and, uh, and, and adventure within this, within this kind of cityscape. So you said story games. I'm not familiar with that classification. So what do you mean by that? Um, you know, the, the, the style of kind of role-playing game adjacent games where the purpose is to structure a story more than it is to uh, play out a character. So any game, like I would define story games as any game wherein the narrative responsibility of the larger story structure inhabited in the game is put on the players rather than being the purview of the game master. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So you talked a little bit about, you know, we asked about the cheap shots and we talked a little bit about, you know, the two main components, the heart, and the comfort and, and all of that. So is this one where the characters have like some sort of alignment? Because I've seen some of the fight mantra or sort of the tropes in the fighting movie space that inspired this. You've got the 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 villain fighter who, you know, fights dirty and he just wants to win or she, you know, um, is that sort of built into this game where you have an alignment or is that left up to the game master to fit in the NPC characters. There's no, there's no alignment for the player characters, but people find their alignment anyway, right? They find their alignment for the character um, and it, and it changes character to character, player to player. And some of that is based on circumstance. So if somebody is part of a karate school that whose motto is strike hard, strike first, no mercy, um, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll find themselves playing a particular kind of character. They may end up breaking with that and perhaps intentionally breaking with that. But the fact is, as characters grow and change and develop over the course of many years, uh, you, no matter what you do, you really end up finding out who that character is. And you kind of develop a, a, a mantra or a motto or a, a modus operandi for that character um, as you go. So, no, there's no alignment system, but they're they're really, given the structure of the game, there just doesn't need to be because people are going to play it out uh, with a particular notion in mind anyway. So let's, let's talk about that, the nature of the game. So you mentioned that this, the engine that you're using is one uh, that is, is two, you know, the skills and the the comforts is that something that came from other games or did you build this just for this game i mean it bears everything in it bears similarities to other games more or less um but it's it's largely it's its own animal like you can say that the uh i developed the choice of moves and then comparing the moves against each other uh independently but I, there is a very similar structure that happens in burning wheel and mouse guard uh in some ways it's similar uh, and, you know, it's kind of a rock, paper, scissory thing. Uh, so, like, there's that to lean on. Uh, Blades in the Dark had a kind of similar structure to comforts in a way. But everything is kind of, uh, the screws are tightened around this being a closed design. So it doesn't take from any one thing particularly. Uh, but I'm inspired by quite a few things. I don't know if you know uh, Greg Stafford's King Arthur Pendragon. Uh, wonderful game. It's a more traditional game, uh, but it has a generational aspect to it, and it also uh, pioneered the idea of generational play and passing on your uh, the mantle of who your player character is as you go down through the years. I was very inspired by that, so I uh, brought a similar kind of system into this game uh, to, to move the the narrative timescape around at, at a fairly quick place uh, pace and try and get a panorama. So then you get kind of snapshots of people's lives as you move the calendar along and it becomes uh, in some ways more emotionally resonant. And I really liked that out of the Pendragon. So I, I uh, adapted it to here. So, yeah. 
So let's uh, first off, is there an optimal size for a table for this game? Oh yeah, definitely. It's five. Uh, five, five players and one GM. Yeah, the game is, uh, you know, every game has its strength and, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I would not suggest trying to play this game with more people than five. I've definitely played a game with as few as two players, uh, and it works, but it's richer the more people you have because, uh, to a point, because the comforts become more and more interconnected. So like the sports car that you've got, uh, as your thing, you know, could have come from the other player because they lost it in a gambling debt or something. So you have uh, the comforts of associations across different uh, characters at the table. So they take on meaning for different people. So when that sports car is stolen or when it's wrecked or when, you know, it's it gets into a car accident, it has different uh, ramifications for those characters. So the, the optimal size is, is six people, one GM and, and five players. But you can definitely run handsome, wonderful games with four and with three players. And, 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 and you can definitely do two players. So is this, it sounds like this game, the fighting takes place everywhere. Uh, I, originally at first I thought maybe it was like an arena game. Cause you know, some of the, some of the fighting movies were happening in, in fight contest. So is there any, um, or is this thematic, but like, obviously if you've got two dudes brawling in the middle of the street, sometimes the cops get involved. Yeah. Do you factor that kind of stuff in? Absolutely, Please. you do. Most most play groups end up run a, running a foul of of police at some point or another. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a genre, um, you know, it's taking inspiration from all these films where people are doing like um, deep underground tournaments that no right. one has seen. You know, it's it's a. Uh, uh, so similarly, you end up on the kind of, you know, the bad side of the law being a renegade or what have you. I have known people to go the other direction. Some play groups go the other, other direction and become like a karate cop or something uh, and uh, and work for, for truth and justice. But, you know, have their sergeant yelling at them like, you can't do this anymore, kid. You're tearing yourself apart. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that could also be a lot of fun. Uh, but you're going to have to deal with the cops one way or another eventually. Uh, is is kind of one of the pivoting points in the in the prolonged history of of play. Yeah, is that built into the game system, or is that something that's brought to the table by the the game master? Um, it's in it's in the game system, but it's that that I think is more brought to the table by the game master because the problem is it's taking place throughout the 20th century because the game sessions move up the years pretty quickly. You can decide to start play in 1982. You can decide to start play in 1912. It, like it's, it's up to you and, and how long you want to play and different points in the 20th century mean very, very, very different things in terms of law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, it, because it certainly means very different things in terms of racism and in terms of, uh, uh, of who you are and, and cultural oppression and economic oppression and cultural boundaries. And, uh, how much your table wants to deal with those issues is very pivotal. Uh, you know, if, if you're playing uh, a fellow who comes from Hong Kong and it's the, the 1910, you're going to have a hard time finding a hospital that will admit you. Right. And now if you really want to play with that and like explore what that circumstance is in the early 20th century, you're going to have a particular kind of relationship with police uh and uh and with with law enforcement and with political structures if that's not something that interests your table i mean it's going to be hard not to get a, to get around issues of of uh of like the the history of martial arts in the 20th century is one of profound uh crossing cultural barriers and learning from different cultures and different peoples and peoples uh, mixing and intermingling and sharing knowledge and especially after World War II, after uh, General Douglas MacArthur's scat ban on Japan and, and the mass migration of people uh, out of uh, uh, Japanese-occupied China, uh, it's, it, it becomes a really big deal how you fit in as a, as a cultural outsider and how you introduce your martial arts to the world and how you deal with, uh, with your knowledge of martial arts. So I didn't want to come down hard and fast on how to, uh, well, this is the police and this is what they do, because you could adopt so many perfectly relevant perspectives on where you are as a person, whether you're disenfranchised uh, within the structures of your time or whether you're not. And relative to both the history you're dealing with and how how heavy do you want to go as a as a player and as a group? Does that make sense? It does. So obviously we all know that there are, you know, as many as you can think of, there's hundreds of thousands of variations of martial arts. Some of them differentiated differentiated only by name um so within the context of the game itself is everybody using the same quote martial arts system 
or is it i mean are there like oh well you're a karate guy and so you get a i don't know plus one against the grappling like is there built-in mechanic for the types of martial art yeah there's definitely built-in mechanics for the types of martial arts um i'm kind of a martial arts snob i practiced martial arts for many years i i taught briefly um so i wanted to make that relevant but i also wanted to make that approachable so there's five different martial arts from the onset and they kind of represent the five different moves so there's karate kung fu kickboxing uh western boxing like boxing and wrestling those are the five moves you kind of have, have as an introduction there are more than 50 martial arts detailed in the game uh, if you really want to get into the to the minutia of um, you know the differences between Krav Maga and Ochitawa, or uh, you want to just explore Chao Gar um, as a northern praying mantis style versus southern praying mantis style of kung fu, then you know like it's, it's all it's all covered. How the martial arts inform each other is not by affecting your character, but by opening the door, and it is up to you as a student to walk through that door. So they give bonuses to what is called your training regime, because the idea of training had to have a lot of, uh, I wanted to have a lot of mechanical relevance in the game. Like, what's the best part of Rocky IV? The best part of Rocky IV is the, like, half an hour he spends doing one training montage, then walking out into the snow saying, hi, Adrian, and then going back into an even better training montage, right? That's the best part right. of Rocky IV. Uh, so let's give that some mechanical relevance, because again, you know, that can all be done by downtime, hand-wavy stuff, but let's let's give it some meat. So each character has a training regime. You get bonuses to that training regime as to what is easier to train about based on what your body size is, what your body type is, based on what your martial art is, based on if you're at your stage, so you have access to your training equipment that's at the stage, and who your teacher is, based on what their curriculum is that they get there teaching you. Uh, so different teachers from different martial arts curriculums will teach you different things. So if you've got a, a Kung Fu teacher, he might be teaching you nothing but floor walking for the longest time. You're just going to develop your footwork by walking back and forth across this floor and then turning around and walking across the floor again in low squat posture that burns your thighs. Whereas if you're a uh, teaching, uh, you're learning from a boxing coach, you know, he might be like, uh, you might set you on the speed bag to increase your punching technique and you get a bonus to the punching technique. It's up to you if you actually invest your training points into punch to increase your punching technique it's up to you how you train and develop but boxing is affording you that possibility of a little curmudgeonly burgess meredith standing by you saying like you gotta go faster rock <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh and hitting the speed bag so again like uh, just over 50 martial arts i think at last count in the book um in, in various levels of detail but i still wanted to make sure it was nice and approachable with a kind of like very very good but beginners kind of five martial arts uh so people could geek out about it if they really want to geek out about it uh but it still makes sense as a as a layman you don't have to know martial arts to do it so do you think players as they play this game are going to learn about various martial arts or will it be the illusion <clears throat> of knowledge well you know it's like it's like 1981's enter the ninja right like is it actually giving you knowledge uh no it's more it's more it's, it's telling you what is going on within the cultural circumstance. You know, you can learn that Taekwondo became really popular in the West only after the 1988 uh, Seoul Olympics. And then, you know, all the Taekwondo schools started after that. You can learn that academically. And you can learn that Taekwondo is really good at kicks. Uh, but I'm hoping that everything that's in the game is a springboard to imagination. So it will propel you both into play. And if you fall in love with these ideas, you can go out and you can you can really learn what they are and you can really learn what they are properly. Uh, I, I may not have, uh, you know, completely represent. There might be people out there who uh, will look at my book and say, oh, this this Goju Ryu karate is a lot more like Okinawa Tei. I can't respect this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so it's uh, some of it is a matter of, of, of debate, whether you're talking about like cause people have rivalries within the martial arts world. Right. They're like, Ying Yi Quan, come on. Like Xing Yi is obviously uh, like Ying Yi is obviously derived from the horse forms poorly taught from Xing Yi. Like, seriously, everybody knows that <laughs> everybody knows that. So uh, you're never going to you're never going to make anybody happy. The, the very fact that I use the term Kung Fu uh, is, is kind of a faux pas. And uh, the fact that ninjutsu is in there at all is subject to, to a bit of debate. But I want to be able to capture the fun as well of these like, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies and the cinema, cinema and Cynthia Rothrock films and direct to VHS uh, kind of martial art fun fests. 
as well as the, if I'm not asking too much from the universe, kind of gritty reality of how, how lousy it is to get into a fight in your, your frail and aging body and how quickly things can turn south. So you did mention one of the, the components of your game is that generational play because, you know, the game can span a lot of years. So when you say, okay, my character X is going to retire, mm-hmm. now, is it a, a situation where, well, my character might be retiring, but now he's picking up coaching and he's ca- coaching my next character to keep them in the game? Or is it once they're done, they're basically done? Well, it could be. It depends how they did it. It depends how they left. Right. Because if uh, there's a number of different options as to how uh, somebody can succeed you uh, being your player character, one of them is that they died in battle or like died in a fight or died or resolved their wounds or just died being hit by a car. And that dictates certain things that you get to inherit. If they decide to teach you everything they know and then leave and be like, I'm retired, that that gives you a certain set of stuff because each character kind of builds on the last one. Right. Uh, and if they decide to continue on as your teacher, that gives you a different set of stuff. So either way, they recede into being an NPC, so to speak. Uh, but what their role in the game going forward is, you you get to dictate that to the GM. Be like, no, no, no. I still want my character to be around. It's just they're like, you know, pushing 60. And and I've like my son is like in his 30s. Like, let's let's start using the son character and he'll be my player character. And I'll be like, OK, but once you cross that Rubicon, uh, there's no going back. And like, how do, how do you want him to go out? And he's like, well, I think he just needs to step back because, you know, he's 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 dealt with such horrible injury. I'm like, OK, but, you know, uh, if you want to continue as a teacher, he, he gets written down as one of the comforts. And I'm like, OK. But just so you know, your old character's on the chopping block now. Like, <laughs> this is oh, because you could get rid of the character when you're getting rid of the comfort. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so it's uh, it becomes very it can become very dramatic when people are like, "No, my teacher!" Ah! Like, and, uh, that is, so it sounds like yeah. this game relies really heavily on the individual players getting into the role playing aspect of it, as opposed to being crunchy and mechanical. Well, you know, if you have a, I've often found that if you have a system without initiative the people who speak the loudest at the table get to go more and the people who are shy at the table don't. And so I've always been very cognizant of making sure that there are structures in play, uh, both to reward creativity, but also to level the playing field in terms of equal time and spotlight. So uh, does the game reward and flourish with creativity? Yes, absolutely. But I think there's enough mechanics in place. There's enough slides that are greased that it's easy for people to uh, follow one step into a few available options, just given the the genre that we're talking about and the kind of structures that would exist within this genre. It's people find it very easy to role play, even people who are uh, typically very shy at role playing because uh, the situation is kind of presented for you in some ways. Like, again, it's a springboard to action. So you can look at your hardship and you can know, oh, I'm stressed out. And I need to go to Reva's diner. Well, what, what are you doing? Like, how are you using Reva's diner to not be stressed out? And you're like, I don't know. I'm just getting a coffee. I'm just going to sit and have a coffee. And I'm going to stare out the window. And I'm going to, like, just enjoy the city nightlife a little bit. You know, these are the kind of things that you get out of people that typically wouldn't get into a role play like scenario. And it ends up enriching their character quite a bit. Because it doesn't have to be more than that, right? Like, just, you know, let's let's touch on these ideas just enough to keep them going and to keep things going in a mechanically relevant way. So we can always return back to, okay, what does that mean in terms of the numbers, in terms of the mechanics in a way that's not too complicated to keep track of. Uh, we know that we've checked the box of like, okay, you had a hardship. You, you overcame the hardship by applying the comfort. You know how much that it, it helps you. It didn't you know wipe out your hardship. You're feel, still feeling stressed out, but it's just not as bad. Uh, and then we know what happens next. We know that, oh, you know, the thugs are going to come in and try to raid the diner and because they want to, like, uh, toss the cash register. And are you going to get involved? And and then the character has to sit there because it's ultimately a game about hard choices. The character has to sit there and be like, I don't know, I got a lot of injury from melts earlier in the year. And I don't know if I can survive. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this, but, like, I've got to step up. And so it ends up challenging the player a little bit as opposed to challenging the character because you keep running into these moments where you're like, I could lose this. I could lose this character. I could end the story here. Like it could all end here. What do I do? And to me as a developer and as a GM, like those are the moments you're chasing. The moment when somebody knows that their choices are going to be meaningful. 
So does it reward creativity? Absolutely rewards creativity. But I wanted to make sure that there was enough structure in place so that it wasn't just kind of arbitrary daydreaming. The whole thing fit towards a larger structure that would be always moving forward, driving forward, keeping the energy high and keeping interesting things happening at all times. I like it. So two things. So obviously we're at the hour 20 and I've had a lot of fun, but uh, I know you, it's, it's late your time, so I don't want to take forever. First, um, are any of the play tests that you've done over the years, were any of them available for viewing for the people that might be considering what it looks like? Hey, I'm going to back this because $12 isn't that much, but I don't know about playing because plenty of people collect games that they never play. Are there any recorded play tests of these uh, that people can watch? You know, I was foolish not to record any of them. No, there are no actual plays. Uh, that's one of the things that's on my, you know, uh, the chopping block that I'm hoping to do over the next week or two. I've got two different groups that are uh, have promised me their recordings that will try to get this out there uh, so that it uh, gets to happen. I, you know, I ran games at at Vancouver's uh, Terminal City Tabletop Convention this last weekend and at Gary Con, and I didn't think to record either of them. But um, yeah, that's just something I've got to do. That's my failure. <laughs> okay. So not yet, but maybe by the time this um, this game comes to fruition, people that have backed it might be able to get that. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Sweet. I also needed to get out a quick start. I haven't gotten out the quick start yet, but <laughs> so it's on the <laughs> chopping block. Fair, fair. Uh, so you did mention, and then you know we'll start wrapping it up in a second. You did mention that the players had their comforts and their moves. The moves are pretty basic, and it's just picking the order they're going to do them. Um, but when it comes to the comfort, is that something that's from a pre-generated list or is that something the GM creates or is that something the player can say, you know, I really want my comfort to be my, you know, my dog Rover. A combination of all of them. Like what I tend to do, especially for convention games is just write down a few comforts on some cue cards and throw them in the middle of the table. And then people can kind of like, look at what they really feel inspired by. Uh, if we're starting a larger play session, then, uh, you know, people tend to toss out ideas and then we try and generate them from the ideas. Sometimes people have a very clear idea of what's going on. Sometimes they don't. I find that a combination of those things works best because I might have a, a kind of some ideas about where I want to go with this. I'm like, okay, I kind of want to focus things in uh, the Richmond, which is the old town in Metro City, which is kind of stuck in a perpetual 1950s because that's where it hit its peak. And it's something like Streets of Fire, uh, you know, the Walter Hill film. So I'd like to kind of focus in there. So I'd like to pick out Reva's Diner uh, as one of the comforts that is going to be available for people. Maybe they're not going to pick it, but whatever. And uh, I'd like to pick out, uh, you know, Tom Cody as the as this other guy that you know who's like a soldiery fighter type and he's going to be hanging around causing trouble or self saving you from trouble depending on how you deal with them and feel about them and uh so I, I make up a few people places and things present them to the players they might bite they might not bite sometimes people are like yeah sure i'll take your plot hooks and sometimes people uh are gonna go like no like i'm i'm on my dog rover i'm gonna have my dog rover and I'm gonna have my mom because I love my mom, and I'm gonna my place is gonna yeah. be a laundry, gonna be a laundry bed. Let's go. I'm like, okay, fine, sure. I'm like, we're just populating the city as we go, right? Like, uh, we're we're filling in all the cracks just by virtue of how people are playing. Okay, so you you mentioned that they could start anywhere in the 20th century, and that you know play the game forward, which I think is kind of cool. Eventually, games are gonna get to the point where you've hit the present and you're in the near future. And eventually you have to contend with the fact that technology is going to change. I don't know, maybe aliens visit us. Is there any mechanic if the players get so into their campaign, you know, they played the 19th century, the 20th century, the 21st century, and they're like, okay, now what? Where they can add to the game or is the mechanic sort of fit human versus human and basically modern times is the limit? Well, there's a lot of great science fiction martial arts movies like Jean-Claude Van Damme's Cyborg is one of them. Uh, Future I Kick by Don Dragon Wilson is another one. Uh, any excuse for like crazy Ray-Ban sunglasses and cyborg helmets and stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's um, uh, like I love that stuff. Um, this is supposed to be meant to be kept mundane, but like whatever. You can, you can easily bring the content there. I'll tell you, one of the expansion books in the stretch goal is how to extend it into a kind of retro-futurist uh, 21st century, how to extend the game into uh, into genres like, into a kind of genre niche of a niche like Cyborg. Um, or, is, or there, is there support for that? Yeah, it makes sense in the game. Like the structure is there in the game. You can just keep playing. Uh, but, uh, and you can continue on to the tw into the 21st century. There's nothing stopping you. But in terms of theming, uh, you know, I'm trying to, 
to do art across the 20th century because it's so ripe with history and an understandable history and uh, cell phones tend to mess up complications. <laughs> so is that, what was the stretch goal to get to that? Like what is, if people are like, this is my jam, I'm going to definitely back this and I want to get that stretch goal. What Do you know what it is off the top of your head? I don't know what it is off the top of my head. And also, oh, well, I, I'll pretend that I know and I'll say, oh, you'll find out next Wednesday when I release the stretch goals on social media. Okay, okay. <laughs> There. because there, there's there. there's a number of there's a number of stretch goals a number of expansions i want to do it's a big it's a big healthy line like this is the core rule book it's everything you need but i really wanted to do a whole book just on shaw brothers kung fu films and golden harvest kung fu films from the 70s and 80s and right. that is I a whole a whole <laughs> world unto itself right that's a whole right. world so uh, i wanted to do kind of one offshoot book for each of the major martial arts approaches and use those as excuses for expanding the rules in different ways in ways that aren't strictly necessary for play but like if you wanted to go deeper down and learn about all the weird kung fu weapons that you got available like we can go down that rabbit hole together and uh, so that's one of the expansion books another one is how to take it into like a techno future because people have already described this to me as this kind of plays like a cyberpunk without the technology I was thinking that too, as you were talking. So I see that. Yeah. Cause it's kind of got that, like, let's invest in and have fun with the kind of tragedy and the, uh, the sadness and the struggle of daily life. Uh, but it, it manages to do that without the technology, but the technology is lots of fun and cyberpunk's lots of fun. And there's no reason why we can't go down that route. So that's one of the expansion books that's, that's, uh, founded. I think it's called like beat down techno city or something. I'd have to look it up, but it's, a uh, it's a nifty one, and uh, it's already in the line. Uh, if we don't get these expansion books funded, that's fine. They're coming out anyway, uh, because, you know, why not? It's a lot of fun. Like, we're doing this for fun. <laughs> so you, you mentioned expansion packs, and I was thinking, you know, the fun thing about all the games is the bestiaries. Now, normally, Kung Fu, you don't really fight animals. It's kind of frowned upon to hit animals. But I also know the Polish, for instance, enlisted a bear that fought with them in World War II and even loaded ammo. So there are some animals that are capable of assisting in a fight. Is that something to be incorporated? Well, you know, uh, it, they say that Chen Sen Feng, who uh, developed the first style of Taiji Quan, uh, once used the carry tiger to the mountain technique to rip a leaping tiger in half. Uh, so that's that's a kung fu myth or, or or legend sorry kung fu legend uh so there is a lot of interaction with animals that could be had uh could you fight with animals yeah absolutely you can fight with animals but the, the diff because it can work within the mechanics but the default is that you get the kind of character and the motivation of fighting with other people and okay. in each of these expansion books there are going to be reams and reams and reams of opponents so that you can broken down by era and uh, with a little description of what they're doing and why they're there and what's going on uh, without being too hefty. Cause like I've done beast series before where you take up a, a whole page for one monster and that's great. And it's colorful. And like it's, it inspires you forward, but like let's be practical and pack a lot of stuff into an narrow space so that we can really use it. Uh, you need to come up with about like, I don't know, two or three, maybe four or five uh, opponents for the structure of a year. You might not use them all. And then the people end up becoming recurring villains like Shredder on Ninja Turtles. You know, they're like, oh, I'll get you yeah, next time. Down. I'll get you next time, Turtles. And then you end up seeing them like every couple of years, they'll come up as the problem until that, that situation eventually reaches a crescendo. So who you populate as your kind of opponents is important. There's going to be lots of opponents in the core book. And then each of the expansion books will allow me to go even crazier down the little rabbit holes of, of, genres within the martial arts structure that can be used like the kung fu book can detail uh you know pai mei for instance uh it can de de detail uh sante from 36 chamber of the shaolin it can detail the five deadly venoms like i can get uh crazy specific in a way that i couldn't in the core book uh but uh, the core book general purpose last you for years because i'm pretty adamant in the fact that like everything you need to play should be in one place right <laughs> Uh, I've been getting very frustrated lately at the number of especially indie digest uh, five and a half by eight and a half books that come out that don't even have the character sheets in them. And I'm like, yeah, I know that they're on PDFs. I know. But like, come on, like, let me read the whole thing in one sitting. Like, let me let me go over the whole thing. So uh, everything will be in the book. Uh, some of the things will be available separately, like play sheets and, and things, but it will all be in the book and everything you ha ever want with the game will be in there. And then for those of you who are crazy about it, like me, uh, you can follow me on this magical journey of bringing out these smaller slot books. 
So we talked about Cobra Kai. So this will be my last question, I promise. But uh, this is fascinating to me, and I'm I'm going to have to see if I can wring some quarters out of my pocket to back this. But uh, the like Cobra Kai, Karate Kid, like all of that was built around the concept of the school, right? You're part of X school. Uh, a lot of it was arena based, but is there a feature built into the game or is it would just be more of the theme where you could be part of, I don't know, not Cobra Kai, not Cobra Kai dojo, for instance? Oh, of course, of course. Like the teacher that you choose, like Mr. Miyagi is part of the Miyagi-Do school, right? Whereas John Kreese is part of the uh, the, the Cobra Kai school of Tong Sudo out of, out of Korea. And so there was some different methodologies and you end up getting, no matter what you do, you're going to end up getting into like rival dojo concerns. Uh and uh, if that's your jam and that's what you want to lean into and that's what you want to deal with, then those things end up getting played up a lot. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. I think Cobra Kai is kind of the perfect Petri dish for representing this game because people fall into misunderstandings and little dramatic bits and then they end up having to fight. And, and then uh, it all kind of crescendos in the big school hallway fight at the end of the, the second season. And what happens as a result of that? Well, now everybody is in more trouble and violence is harder to get into because there's all these lockdowns. And it's a great game for reper- or a, ga- a great show for repercussions. It's not perfect, but you know, I, no, whatever. It's fun. Uh, and that's... Um... <coughs> Sorry. That's easily the kind of thing that you can achieve and fight to survive. Uh, just like how a game of Dungeons and Dragons, people often start off thinking, I'm thinking Lord of the Rings, they end up at Holy Grail. Uh, sometimes you start off with like thinking of a blood sport in Fight to Survive and you end up with a Miami connection. I don't know if you ever <laughs> saw Miami connection. But, um, but a Cobra Kai is a really like reasonable middle ground where people tend to find themselves with this game in terms of the drama and in terms of what they can do. Cobra Kai is a great example too because it's multi-generational, right? You've got right. you've got John Kreese and you've got Mr. Miyagi on one tier, and then you've got like uh Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence on another tier, and like Ali and people who are in their uh periphery, and then you got Miguel and Robbie and all these young kids uh on another tier as the students. And it's really easy in this game to have like a teacher student relationship that is uh carried down and and things relevantly uh happen dramatically over those purposes and you can defend your dojo and your dojo's honor uh you know people can walk into your dojo and smash your dojo sign and say your kung fu sucks and uh away you go. <laughs> have you done that in a game that you like? absolutely how can i not right like uh, <laughs> somebody walks in carrying the sign you know the sign for your school and smashes it and it's like i challenge you all you know it's a, that's uh a, that's the fun of it right that, that is awesome. So you've created a lot of games uh, and you have potential to do more in this setting. Um, so when you create these creatures, the the aliens, monsters, whatever that the populate your games, how do you go about doing that as a creator? Do you let your nightmares inspire you? Do you create it out of whole cloth? Do you use legend and lore? What is your go-to inspiration when you're creating the wee beasties? Uh, well, I'm an academic. So I, I go into research mode and I, you know, hit JSTOR and I do a lot of deep diving into research. When I did uh, Creatures from Fairy Tale and Myth for Pendlehaven Press, we went really deep into some of the biz- most bizarre monsters that you've never heard of, like the Boogle Nas, who is a kind of uh, corn Cornish shepherd that will lead you off cliffs instead of tending oh. a sheep, you know, things like that. Like like monsters that are really, really out there. Like the difference between the Huldul folk and the Huldra uh, of Slavic myth and, and trying to dissect what it is, what, what exactly is going on, uh, which one of them has a hollow back and uh, what happens if you fill that back. And uh, the, my personal favorite one of them was the Glaistig, who is kind of like a ghost, but she drank a lot of water. And as long as she drank enough water, she was substantial. And if you treated her well, she made an excellent wife and would run your castle very well. But if you didn't treat her well, and she didn't drink water, she would become a ghost and haunt the castle, and she would be displaced in time and give you warnings from the future. Uh, so, yeah, and that's all from history, right? That's all already history that's been done. Uh, it's just there for the plucking. So let's take it out. In terms of fight to survive, I've just watched a crap ton of bad, <laughs> wonderful, bad martial arts movies. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna waste your time here, but I am gonna tell you. So I was watching American Kickboxer two the other day. It has no relationship to Amer- American Kickboxer one. It was a 1993 film. It opens on a wealthy couple uh, with their daughter. 
uh, in a mansion, like some kind of Beverly Hills mansion or something. And the daughter's playing in the pool and the husband and wife like get distracted in the kitchen or whatever. And then there's a helicopter that comes out of nowhere. And a guy jumps out of the helicopter on a ladder and into the pool and kind of clumsily shuffles around the pool and then kidnaps the daughter and they fly away and they get a menacing phone call with a ransom demand. So in terms of trying to represent that and fight to survive, it's like, oh, the daughter is a comfort and the comfort is now under threat. Uh, you know, so you take that hardship and then you have to go out and get the daughter back. So the plot of the movie the, is the next thing that she does is she phones up all the guys she was dating at the time that the daughter was conceived, who all happened to be expert martial artists. And then all these expert martial artists have to go on a quest to get this daughter back. And I, I'm like, <laughs> this is a stupid movie. And I loved the setup. I was like, this is a really, this is hilarious. Like all these, all these guys are like, yeah, the, the, the kid might be mine. So I'm fighting for her. And then going off and getting into these fights with like, I don't know, Colombian drug lords or something. I didn't pay attention to that part, but the, the, the setup was wonderful. And I think that there's a lot uh, to discover in this genre uh, that is unmined that we can really appreciate at the table and we can appreciate mechanically and relevantly in a game like fight to survive so what do i do for research on the beasties and the opponents i watch a ton of bad martial arts movies i play a whole bunch of fighting games uh and uh i immerse myself in the world and out comes these characters all right so do you have an archetype built for chuck norris who cannot be defeated of course I do. Of course I do. Chuck Norris was a was a very accomplished man. Like, uh, uh, you know, he 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 did Tong Soo Do actually, which is a Korean form of karate. Uh, he did many other other martial arts, but his foundations are in Tong Soo Do, which is why he can punch uh, and kick pretty evenly. Because Korean martial arts are typically known for their foot of their their kicking, but uh, uh, karate gives him a solid foundation of punch. So he's got really good overall structure, and you can really see that in Return of the Dragon and the Colosseum fight with him and Bruce Lee, uh, and. Interestingly, Tong Sudo is what Cobra Kai is supposed to be learning, right? It's a more kickboxing form of karate, which is why Johnny Lawrence does the kicks, the kid, uh, kicks get chicks. So uh, how could Chuck Norris not feature in uh, in a structure like this? I, even if I'm just taking from his, like, I don't know, Firewalker phase or his, like, Invasion USA mullet, uh, you know, he's got to he's got to appear somewhere. Okay. And um, please, please, please tell me you made Steven Seagal the bad guy. How can he not be a bad guy? <laughs> I know people who absolutely hate him, but his... I, I appreciate that ponytail. But uh, otherwise, he's uh, he's like he's a, he's a tall guy, right? He's he's six four. He's my height, but he's um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, my my I I don't know. Like it's hard not to like under siege and above the law, right? But uh, beyond that, I, I don't have much. Uh, uh, you know, I don't have a tremendous amount of respect for Steven Seagal. Like, certainly, if if I ever did, then the watching him be a police officer on a, on a live action show really, really yeah, that was that was cringe. Yeah, but it, it, uh, but yeah, but he does represent nothing... a certain trope of the time, right? Like right. the the art of fighting character Robert Garcia was largely based on Steven Seagal, and he's a much, probably more interesting character than Steven Seagal is. But uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot to. Um, there's a lot you can mine from that. There's a lot that you can be inspired. Again, like everything has to be a springboard for the imagination and a springboard into action. So clearly this is winding down because I will keep talking because I love this stuff too. And uh, we do need it to be short enough. We can actually fit it on the YouTubes. <laughs> so uh, was there anything that we didn't ask that you wanted to tell us before we wrap this up besides obviously go back to Kickstarter? Um, no, just obviously go back to the Kickstarter. We're 77% funded now. Uh, we have the handicaps that were neither 5E nor powered by the apocalypse. Those are our uh, handicaps. It's a niche system. It's a strange system. You know, I, I explained to you the rules. Uh, some people find it find it to be a learning curve if they're coming from OSR or something, and that's fine. Like, I can blow people's minds. That's, that's something we can do. Um, but uh, it does take some getting used to, so it's a little bit harder of a sell in some ways, and it's a niche setting. Right, like we're not throwing fireballs, we're not doing something fantastical. Uh, there are quite a few kind of fighting game, role playing games where you can play an anime like character. Uh, we don't need to do that. We're a little bit more uh, grounded. Not to say that one thing is better than another, but this is just this, this is the direction we went, and this is the direction I like uh, for things like I don't know if you ever saw. Um, the Charles Bronson film, Hard Times, 1975. Okay. 
I love that movie, and and this game is one of the primary inspirations for this movie for this game. Uh, you know, a 1933 New Orleans street fighter just drifting around, uh, trying to scrounge up a dollar by by beating people up. Uh, that's exactly what this game is is going for. Is something down to earth like that uh, that is going to lead you through a, a, gr a great and interesting experience. So that's a very far away from you know Street Fighter Two harnessing psycho energy and hurling fireballs. There is some interesting connections between it because the backgrounds and hard times were used in Street Fighter II as stages, but uh, for for the inspiration for the artists. But um, we want to fit Fight to Survive within that milieu. Like I love Street Fighter. Street Fighter is great, but uh, this is this is down to earth, low stakes, personal stakes. Your girlfriend has been kidnapped. Get her back, uh, and that's what we're going to go with going forward so yeah I, what, what do i want to say we're 75 percent funded now i think we're 77 or something percent funded at the time of this recording before i came on here so goodness knows where it is now so we're going to make it it's just a case of do you do you want to be a part of this and i want you to be a part of this and there's lots of ways to be a part of this and you can still influence the world uh you can as an add-on you can in it, you can give me an opponent you can make your own opponent you can put yourself in the game you can make a stage. You can make your own martial arts school. If you want to make JR's karate school, and you get to pick the street, it's going on the map, and it's going to be part of the game world. Uh, so there's still an opportunity for people to contribute for the community to speak on what you want to see in the game. Uh, but the, me the mechanics are gone, done. The game structure is done. But like, I'd love it if people would contribute to the lore. All right. So... This is as true for, for games as it is for books. So we're going to remind you, dear listener, that uh, please be kind and speak your minds on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers and players find the right books and games. Um, so do the thing. And I happen to know if you buy it through Drive-Thru RPG, they do have a review feature. Uh, there are other RPG digital vendors that and they all um the ones i've seen have all allowed you to review the products uh if you can't review it there but you back the kickstarter start a blog and review it on your blog i don't care do the things people but but spread the good word of the books and the games that you love because they help your creators have the ability to reach more people and spread so they can keep doing the things so now that we've got that out of the way it's sort of our thing we remind people to review products james kerr um can you tell listeners how they can find you you can find me at radiojamesgames.com. You can find a Radio James Games Facebook page and Discord. And for the next little while, at least, you can search for Fight to Survive, role-playing martial arts meets heart on Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter is on now. Outstanding. And uh, once the Kickstarter is funded, because I have absolutely faith that it will, I will update the uh, the show notes on this episode, and we will link to where you can buy it after that. Uh, because if you're listening and the Kickstarter has finished and he's successfully done his thing and you say, you know what, I'd still like to pay for this game, even though it's not Kickstarter, I will link you to where you can buy it because he's not going to turn your money away, people. That's not how the world works. So you can find us, dear listener, on our Twitter at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can join us for the shenanigans on facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. It is a great community where you can join the shenanigans, talk about all the things, sci-fi fantasy science, all the things people we, we have those discussions and it's lots of fun uh you can torture saska and tell her why pineapples absolutely do not belong on pizza um you can join us on our website where you can follow us at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades again anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades where you can also support us for as little as 99 cents a month you can help keep the light on um, or you could support the show over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it is for the podcast, and I promise I will keep my co-hosts, Doc Seska and Nick Garber, duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders, and if she was here, she would tell you she's not a quitter. So uh, anyway, as we bring this to a close, I have one question left for you, Mr. James. Oh, yes. This is the most important question we've asked you all night. Are you ready? I am, I am born ready. All right. How do you feel about pineapple on pizza? Oh, uh, well, I mean, 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on the other camp. I, I like my pizza with pineapple. Suska cut you up too, didn't she? She set, she set this up. I know no, I'm sorry. Too. Like I, I'll, I'll fight you. I'll fight you over it. You know what I will. <laughs> we have the uh, uh, for a tournament. I, I want pineapple uh, your... on my pizza. It's it's sweet. It's nice. You know, I spent well, then some I'm time gonna... in the Philippines and the pineapples are nice. I'm going to block your kick and like use my footwork <laughs> to, to knock you over on your butt. Exactly. Let's resolve it. Let's do this. <laughs> All right, once and for all, we will have a great tournament. Um, <laughs> so, again, uh, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. <laughs>